I would like to begin today with um, a little story of a family from a remote area who was making their first trip to a big city. They had never visited a big city before and they checked into a very big tall hotel and they were just amazed, um, you know, just the grandeur of what a beautiful place that was. And leaving the reception desk, they came to the elevator entrance and uh, they never seen an elevator before. So it's like, what in the world is this? So they started to figure it out and they couldn't know what it is. And all of a sudden, it was the husband and, and his, one of his sons was standing by and he's like, what in the world, this son? And then the, and then the door opens and then an old lady goes in. An old lady with a cane, you know? And then the door closes and it's like, what in the world is that? And then a minute later, the door opens and a beautiful woman comes out. <laughs> and the man is like, whoa. Son, get your mom real quick. <laughs> Transformation chamber. Uh, very good. So today we're going to talk about the be transformed, how we get to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We're going to read in Romans chapter 12, um, something that we ought to do as Christians. We are told there in verse 2, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So the question that I'm going to lead with today is what does it mean to have our minds renewed? We are asked in the scriptures to have our minds renewed. Okay, it's not easy to understand what that means. What that means is that we need to change the way that we think. Christians are supposed to have a different way of thinking. There's so many opinions out in the world today. Everybody's just having an opinion and everybody's forming their opinions. But our mind as Christians is supposed to be geared towards a specific way of thinking that God wants us to have. So why would we need to change our way of thinking? Why should we change my thinking? And the reason is because most people believe their personal opinion is the basis of truth. Did you know that? People believe that that's your opinion and that is kind of truth because if you believe in it, uh, it's very hard to, mind is a very finicky thing to get it to really, be, once you believe in it, whether it's, it's right or wrong, your mind accepts it as, as truth, even if, especially if you do it for long enough. So actually a market research team called Barna, you probably heard about this, did a survey they survey a large sampling of Americans about 20 years ago, and they found that people are most likely to make their moral and ethical decisions on the basis of whatever feels right or comfortable in a situation. Just whatever makes you feel right. So if you think something is right, it must be right. And you're just not going to hear anybody telling you otherwise. Right? And often you don't even know what's going on and why that is right, why this is wrong. You're just going to believe that and really you're going to go for it. Fight for it if, if all it takes. You may not understand why. In your mind it all makes sense. I read a story actually about um, ants. If you live in the desert, you got to love ants. I have a World War III in my backyard with ants. Primarily because I don't believe in chemical pesticides and they love our backyard okay got so many of them and then they come in the house but I read a story about I don't know if you know this you can take like a hundred black ants and a hundred red ants and you can put them in a jar and everybody minds your own business everything is fine but if you shake that and you put it down they kill each other because they think it's the other person's fault right so the point is, is that many people in our world, even Christians, you know, you point fingers and all of a sudden you end up in this, in this, in this fights, in these arguments, thinking it's the other person's fault. My opinion is better than yours. And it could be totally uh, outside sources in this case with the ants. So think about that. So the Bible says you're supposed to develop a mindset that is not according to what you think, but according to what God thinks. A wealthy man actually had a collection of paintings in one of, one of them was the Leaning Tower of Pisa. I'm sure you've seen it before. It's this tower in, um, uh, in um, Italy that is kind of leaning like this. And they wonder when it's going to fall. Um, it's still standing. 
great touristic attraction, but this, uh, this, this person had a, had a picture of, of, this, of this tower um, in his office, and one day he noticed that the painting was changed, it was crooked, so he strained it, but the next day, you know, somebody turned it, it was again crooked, and that happened for about four to five days. And finally, in frustration, he asked his housekeeper, said, have you been doing something? And the lady's like, yeah, I kind of tilted back this because it just was not right for the, the tower has to hang straight. And you know, that made sense to her. It was not right for the tower to lean like that. So she felt like, you know, she had to make the paint crooked so that the tower could sit straight. I don't know if it's a true story or not, but um, the Bible says that that's kind of the default way of thinking for all of us. All of us, we want to fix things, whatever makes sense to us. I mean, so what if that's supposed to be? It? So what if that tower is supposed to be crooked? I want to make it straight. And that's right now, right? That's how, how people believe. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 to 6 warns us, says, Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will make your path straight. It's not going to be you that is going to make your path straight. Straight. You're supposed to not lean on your own understanding. Can you imagine? I mean, that's so much against the culture today. Yeah, don't lean on your own understanding. When you're going to do whatever you want nowadays, it's like, if you think you're right, Right? You're just going to do whatever you think is right. It's very sad, but people don't understand that they cannot lean on their understanding. God has, has given us a mind, but we are wired so that we gear our mind towards God, not whatever we think is right, because we don't know what's right. It's just plain and simple. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12 warns that there is a way which seems right to a man, it makes sense, but at the end, what? It's the way of death. Oh, you can think that your way is just fine, but in your heart, no issues. But that way can take you straight to hell. And in your heart, you can be exactly persuaded 100% that that is the best way. If you lean on your own understanding. Proverbs chapter 28, verse 26 says, Whoever trusts in his own mind is a fool. I don't know about you, but I don't like to be called a fool. Oh, you're a fool. Thank you very much. That's a nice compliment. No, you trust in your own mind and you're a fool. Thinking that somehow you know better. You don't need anybody to tell you what to do. So why would trusting my own instincts make me a fool? Why would you be a fool if you trust your own? Isn't that supposed to be the right thing to do? Trust yourself? Jeremiah actually gives us the reason why. And he tells us that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Yes, your heart, desperate, our heart, desperately sick. And the rhetorical question there is, who can understand it? Yes, you have a heart. You think you can understand it? Well, uh, maybe your heart is an exception. Your heart is not deceitful. Not just deceitful, deceitful above all things desperately sick you want to trust your heart uh, well go ahead but it's desperately sick not a good idea our heart is deceitful because it really makes us to make poor choices that's one of the reasons why he's so, he's so sick and uh, this happens because our hearts are warped with sin and our thinking has been warped to kind of be adjusted to this world and therefore it's all we live in this in this in this space of unconsciousness to where we don't have the, the knowledge of God and the presence of God and to to understand that it's all around us to understand how it affects us and we live in this in this in this space of of, of being lost and we think that that's just where we're supposed to be unconsciousness you, you you you're not aware of, of the of, of the God around you it's kind of like a dog you know all they want is just food they don't care about anything else they don't worry about who's the president they don't worry about the political battles in Congress and Senate all they want is food can you have some food today they'll bark eventually I have a little dog like this my security system in the house somebody barks bo somebody barks that, that's all he does barks and eats and poops sometimes in the house 
bad dog. In his mind, he is right. Um, but people, Christians are like that, you know, to where all you do is just whatever makes sense to you, whatever makes sense to you, whether you want to do something that it, it doesn't matter if it makes sense to you, do it. And it's just not supposed to be that way. God's thinking is different than our thinking. And we have to craft our thinking according to God's thinking. Isaiah chapter 55, verse 8 and 9. There God tells us, my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. You think your thoughts are better than God's thoughts? Really? You think you know better than God? Really? That's why our heart is sick. Because our heart indeed tells us, I know better than God. Well, a heart that says, I know better than God, definitely there's something wrong with that heart. I think we can all agree with that. So we do need to tie into God's ways and thoughts. And until we do that, we're always going to depend on our own instincts rather than God's own instincts and we're always going to mess, th mess things up if you don't go to the Word of God. <laughs> so the question becomes, where can I go to get God's way of thinking? And yes, it's the Bible. Go out, buy a Bible, bring it home, put it there on your coffee table and by the process of osmosis, it will infiltrate your brain. Is that how it works? I wish. No, doesn't work that way. Doesn't work that way. You have to open it before it will do any good. And more even than once a week. Once a week is not enough. There's a study actually that has been done recently. They discovered something called the power of four. Have you, anybody here heard about the power of four? It's, oh, I know you did. No, it's okay. You will know in a, in a second. So the power of four, the power of four. It was found that if you are at church and preacher says, open to uh, the Bible and you read it once, that is nice. But uh, it has very little effect on the way you're going to be transformed. If you only come into church and you only open the Bible, when you come to church once a week, it's not enough. It's not enough. And they say actually that if on Monday you say, you know what, I'll think I, I think I'll read the rest of that chapter. Like for instance, today in the Bible study, we studied about the book of Ecclesiastes. We studied chapter 12. I don't know who, we're, when we're going to finish it. We haven't finished it. Maybe next week. But it was a fun study. If you go Monday home and you say, I'm going to finish that, book, that chapter in the last uh, chapter of Revelation. Still has little to no effect on your behavior or thinking on your transformation. And then they say that if you open it again on Tuesday, very little discernment change. But if you open your Bible for a fourth time in a week, it becomes to have dramatic effect on how you deal with loneliness, how you handle struggles, how you deal with others, how involved are you going to be with the evangelism. It takes four times. It's weird. This is a study that's been done. It takes four times. It's not enough to just study once. Twice, three times. You have to do it four times. And you know, this is kind of the way of nature too. If, whether you're in business, Lisa and I, we are in business. And sometimes whenever we're going to get a lead with some business, it's not enough to just call the person once. You know, does that work with you? No? What do you do, John? How many times do you touch somebody? Sometimes I touch people for several years. Several years. Well, some are really harder to, um, to you know, up there. But... Right, it's all worth it, but what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to go back and go back and then touch how number of touches you're going to touch that person until they're actually going to respond, which is a correlation. But when it comes to the Word of God, if you really are interested in a transformation, you are supposed to do it four times. Remember the power of four. So the study stated that the lives of Christians, and this is very important, you can forget everything I said today except the introductory illustration. Um, but the, 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 don't forget this slide. This is the conclusion of the study. They say that the lives of Christians who do not engage in the Bible, who do not engage the Bible most days of the week, are statistically the same as the lives of non-believers. You don't open the Bible, you don't read the Bible routinely during the week, and your life as a believer, it's the same pretty much as a non-believer. 
In other words, God's words can't change us if you don't read it. You want to be transformed? Well, if you don't read the Bible, you're not going to be transformed. Especially if you feed your mind constantly every day with everything the world is pumping at you. You know, it's so easy to drive the car and before you know it, you press the button and you listen to the news for like two hours. Right? And I'm not just looking at my wife. I do it to everybody does it. You just indoctrinate yourself with all the bad news, media, fake news, all the garbage going on. So easy. And then you fill your mind with that. But when it comes to the Word of God, once a week, when the Bible, when church comes around, if I'm in church that week. And then you wonder, I want to be transformed. It ain't going to happen. It is not going to happen. I have a quote here by Napoleon Hill. He says that every man is what he is because of the dominating thoughts which he permits to occupy his mind. That is a powerful statement. You allow whatever thoughts you allow in your mind, that's the person that you're going to become. If you allow your mind to be filled with the thoughts of God, with what God wants you to be, with how God wants you to act, speak, be, exist in every way, you're going to be a godly person. But if you allow your, your mind to be the groundwork of, of the world as you constantly bombard it, and when you're not watching news, you're looking on Facebook, that's another travesty over there. Or anything you do, you allow your mind to be bombarded by the world. And you know what? Your mind becomes you're going to express in your life your whatever you you plant that's what you're going to reap right law of sowing and reaping and guess what what happens if you don't plant you know it dawned on me last week you know sowing and reaping what happens if you don't plant if you don't plant nothing is going to grow it's amazing I have some seeds at my house. My daughters love gardening. And they put seeds in the ground and then they grow plants. I have corn at my house. I got tomatoes at my house. You guys should come visit. It's very cool. <laughs> but then one day what I did, I had these seeds, right? Seeds, I had them for years. And I thought for sure they're good because I picked them once from a tree that was very good. And I put them in the ground and I gave them water and they're bad, okay? Nothing came out. I gave them so much water, nothing came out. Because they're bad seeds, or maybe they're dead seeds. And you know, the same thing happens with us. If you don't plant, not just anything, but good seeds, nothing comes out. Or if you plant bad seeds, what is going to come out? Weeds, thank you. Criminal. Criminal, bad, yes. So have this in mind, please. And, you know, the way you get that, I have another quote by Jim Rohn, two quotes today. This is the second quote and last quote, because I love Jim quote, is uh, Jim, Jim quote. Jim Rohn is one of my mentors when, when it comes to understanding some principles of success. And Jim Rohn says, learning is the beginning of wealth. Learning is the beginning of health. Learning is the beginning of spirituality. Searching and learning is where the miracle processes all begin. If you want to draw closer to God, you need to learn His ways. If you want to be healthy, you need to learn what healthy people are doing to be healthy. If you want to be wealthy, okay, nobody here wants to be wealthy. Well, if you want to be financially, to be able to provide for your family, well, maybe you can look at what other people are doing that provide for their family successfully. So, right? And you can do that. But it all starts with learning. If you want to be in a place with God, that you are transformed, that you're going to be in heaven. Remember the picture, the picture I had earlier? You have to learn. You have to learn to draw closer to God so the Word of God comes into your mind and then it transforms you. It transforms you. So the Bible advises us that we are like newborn babes who, desire the pure, who should desire the pure milk of the Word that we may grow thereby. I know you know that passage in 1 Peter. You know, and parents of little children often buy books, you know, to read, but they are very heavy duty because they chew on them. They call them teething books. I had my kids were chewing on them before they realized that now they have a different purpose. Uh, chew on books, right? So they can end up in, people, in, in kids' mouth and then they're going to make it through. Um, but in a similar way, God wants us to gnaw on His book. 
And actually, there's a, there's a, in, in, in Joshua, God tells Joshua, it's a wonderful passage. It says, this book of the law shall not depart, depart from your mouth. I don't know why from the mouth. Maybe because close to your mouth, but keep reading. But you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and you will have good success. You see the formula there? Chew on the word of God. Keep it close to your mouth. Gnaw on it like a dog gnaws a bone. You can give my not very smart but cute dog a bone. And he can chew on it all day long. It reminds me sometimes how we're supposed to treat the word of God. Joshua 1.18. So God is promising Joshua that if he is faithful... In focusing on written scripture, he will receive blessings and success. You want to be successful? You want to have blessings? You're going to focus on the Word of God. You're going to be transformed, and you will be blessed. You will feel the success, because God, just like He promised to Joshua that He will make His way prosperous, He will make your way prosperous too. It's a... Um, it's a... It's a... It's a... It's a it, just, it just... That's how it is. You, you, you do what God wants you to do, you get blessed. If you don't do what God wants you to do, you get what? Cursed. The opposite works too. So, that's how important God views our reading His book. That's how important God thinks about us really spending time in His book. Matthew chapter 6, actually in verse 34 says, Therefore do not worry about tomorrow. And this is just, a, just an example. For tomorrow will worry about its own thing. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Jesus says here, don't worry about tomorrow. And then you say, oh yeah, I'm not worried about tomorrow. Well, God says don't worry about tomorrow. And then in Isaiah, God also tells Isaiah there, forget about the former things. Do not dwell on the past. What do people do? You dwell on the past. You think about the past. You worry about what happened. You worry about the future. And Jesus says, today, don't worry about tomorrow. I found the next slide, the next quote in a, in a book that I'm reading right now. And I wanted to share it with you. I thought it was absolutely brilliant. The author said that worry, and I put a red thing about it. If you are a little bit sleepy, just wake up. Read this, very important. It really made me pause. I was listening to the card and I wrote it down. Um, and then I said, I need to really fit this into my next term because it's so powerful. The author said that worry, unease, anxiety, tension, stress, and fear are caused by too much future. You worry too much about the future and not enough about the present. We live in a world that is so past you think about what's gonna to happen tomorrow 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 when really everything is present and then he said guilt regret resentment grievances sadness bitterness and all forms of non-forgiveness are caused by too much past and not enough present now if we did what God wants us to do and stay in the present and you're not gonna have worry unease anxiety tension guilt regret that is what 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 really occupies and makes our life such misery because we think that when I go to college, I'm going to be happy. When I get married, I'm going to be happy. It's going to be sometimes in the future. But, you know, or next year, I'm going to obey the gospel. But people miss the fact that actually they only have today. They only have right now. They only have right now. Because you know what? Nothing can happen in the future. Why? Because in the future, it will still be now. Have you realized that? Even past. When you think of the past, it happens now. I'm going to be baptized next year. No, it's going to happen now. When you do it, that's what the Bible says. Now is the day of salvation. Today, you are supposed to obey the gospel. Not tomorrow. Because tomorrow, it will still be to now. You, you, will not go, you are not going to be baptized in the future. The only real time is present and now. And if you're not happy now, you're not going to get happy 10 years from now because then it's still going to be now. So, this is just an example how God tells us, I, I said earlier, don't worry about tomorrow. Forget about your past. Live in today in the present. 
Because if you don't do that, you're going to be very unhappy. You're going to be depressed, sad, anxious. Yes, that's why people are anxious and sad. You think about the future. I think about, I worry about this and this and that. My wife's like, don't look at me like that. We all, we all worry. And as, really, this is where all this anxiety and angst is coming from. Because we live in the past. Forget the past. Erase the past. Let go. Forgive. Move on. Don't trap yourself in the past. And the same thing, of course, you're going to plan, but don't be consumed about the future. God is going to worry about your future. God is in the future. You don't have the future. The only have you think you have is right now. Forget about tomorrow. It's not promised. You know that. So, next, he left the instructions that we should... Actually, one second. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. I skipped the slide. Okay. So, my next illustration is about a story about another wealthy person. This one is a rancher who died and he left a will that not only included that his sons would receive, um, you know, whatever he left them as an inheritance, but also included several instructions of things he expected uh, that they should do around the ranch as, as far as work is concerned. So he instructed the kids that they buy some extra land and border it properly, prop, uh, you know, as they should. And, and the boys, you know, talk about themselves and say, you know what, that is right. We should do this. So they bought the land, they opened it up. And then next, the father left instructions that they should build a dam and how they should just uh, dam up the creek and to have water for the cattle, right? Ranchers sometimes do that. And, you know, the, the, the sons were impressed by his father's decision and wisdom, and promptly they did that. This is after he died. And lastly, he wrote that, you know, ki kids, when I die, you know, you're supposed to tear down the barns, the old barns, and you have to rebuild new barns. And the kids said, you know what? I don't think we need to do that. That's just too much work. And the question is, did his sons obey their father's instructions? And you can say, yeah, two out of three. Two out of three. But in actuality, they didn't obey any of the father's wishes. They simply followed their instructions and they did whatever they agreed to. Whatever they thought it was a good idea. They looked on their father's commands as optional, as mere suggestions. And you know... There are people who do that with God. They obey God only when they agree with. If you agree with God, oh yeah, for sure, I'm going to do that. That's for sure. That's the right thing to do. But if you don't agree, I'm not going to do that. By I'm obeying God. No, you're not. Pick and choose. Old Testament says that if you can hold the entire law, but you disobey one piece of the law, you're guilty of the entire law. So, if the Bible says something they're not comfortable with, eh, you're just going to ignore it. They treat God's words as suggestion. They can ignore at their leisure. They just pick and choose whatever they want. And you can take the word of God and you can twist it to justify whatever you want it to say, really. And they do it. So, the point here is that we should not ignore God's word, but let it allow it to transform us. When you decide that you're not going to just follow your own heart, but you're going to follow God. And that is the way that you can be transformed. Because God wants you to be transformed. God doesn't want you conformed to this world, but transformed. Transform according to His will. And that brings me to my conclusion this, uh, this um, um, late morning. And the conclusions I have, I have three points. First of all, we need to remember that Christianity is a relationship with Jesus that results in transformation. You cannot just be yourself, obey Christ, but then still be yourself. It's required of you that you are transformed. That is the, the normal state that God wants to see us. When God sees us as his children, he needs to see different people than the world. Different people with different habits. Second point is that Christians' lives are not modified, not updated. They are changed. They are transformed. It's not like I'm going to be a little bit different. You have to be transformed, radically transformed. Like that old woman transformed into a beautiful woman. Right? Well, you know what I mean. Transform different person. 
You're not going to recognize the person. And third point that I have is that God transform us if we let God transform us. And then through us, God can transform the world around us. You may be here today and your life may not be transformed for Christ. Um, and if your life has not been transformed for Christ, uh, if you still very much like the world or of the world, refusing to obey Jesus or, or come back to him, um, I encourage you to put an end to that. And as we started in the, in the lesson today, to know that the day is right now. I have the passage in 2 Corinthians. This is the last life for today. There Paul is saying, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Now. You only have now. Because tomorrow, tomorrow is not promised to you. And if the Lord comes today, or you hit by a truck on the way home tonight, it's going to be over. So I'm encouraging you today, if there's any of you that have not obeyed the gospel, to not hesitate. To come in forward and, and obey the gospel. And if there's anybody here that... Uh, maybe your life in the past hasn't been transformed or something happened in your life and you want to come forward so that um, um, you can make things right with God and be back on, on that track with God. We ask that you come forward as together we'll stand and um, Bradley will listen to a closing song.